My name is Ellen Wiss, and I'm a member of League of Women Voters of Duluth, as well as a trained and certified LWB moderator. I have the pleasure of moderating this forum on behalf of the League of Women Voters Duluth. I would like to welcome everyone. The League of Women Voters is pleased to present this pre-general election forum for Office of Mayor of Duluth. Thank you candidates for your willingness to participate in local government and in this event. The League of Women Voters believes that informed citizenry is the foundation of effective democracy. The League is open to membership for men and women who are interested in nonpartisan civic participation. The League of Women Voters Duluth realizes that creative and innovative policies and practices are forged out of diverse points of view. We believe diverse perspectives are necessary for responsible and representative decision making. Let us pause to acknowledge our commitment to welcome and facilitate diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of our work. We strive to include people of mixed abilities and backgrounds in all of our activities, and you're invited to join us. For more information, check out our website, lwvduluth.org. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization that works at the state, local, and national level to encourage citizens to participate in government while we as a league do study and take stands on issues. We do not endorse or support parties or candidates. The views expressed at tonight's forum are those of the participating candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters of Duluth. Additionally, LWV sponsorship of this forum is not a league endorsement of any individual candidate participating. Please exercise your right to vote in the general election on November 7th. At this time, I'd like to introduce the candidates, Emily Larson and Roger Reinert. Thank you for being here. Our forum will begin with the candidates giving a two-minute opening statement followed by a questioning round. The questions have been vetted by our Voter Services Committee. Candidates are not given the questions in advance. Each candidate will be given up to two minutes in which to provide their response. The questioning round has been set up so that each candidate will be asked the questions in rotating order. The order in which the candidates are the candidate questions respond are determined at random and will rotate the responses throughout the forum. After the questioning, questioning round is completed, each candidate will be allowed a two-minute closing statement. We will begin the forum with a statement from candidate Reinhardt. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Uh, my name is Roger Reinhardt, uh, and I am running for mayor because, like many of you, I'm just ready for something different. It's time that we expect more and do better with our core city services like streets, utilities, and public safety, our neighborhood parks and community centers, engaging our residents. And I'm running because we haven't had a truly meaningful election for mayor since 2007. Four years ago, two thirds of Duluthians didn't even vote. That's not healthy for Duluth or for democracy. I come to this role with proven public sector, private sector, and military leadership experience. In my day job, I'm a licensed attorney. I teach at the College of St. Scholastica, and I'm entering my 19th year of service in the U.S. Navy Reserves, where I currently hold the rank of commander. I've had the pleasure and the honor to serve on the Duluth City Council, twice elected council president, and I also served three terms in the legislature in both the House and the Senate. After leaving the legislature, I spent a tough year in Afghanistan, and then I deployed overseas again at the start of COVID to Italy. Upon my return, I had the opportunity to step in and provide leadership at the deck and spent a year there helping ensure that critical community assets survived the pandemic. The entire first part of our campaign has been spent listening to voters and taking notes. And out of that came the five big issues that we've talked about uh, for the remainder of the campaign, housing across all income levels, developing our commercial tax base, our streets, downtown Duluth, and affordable property taxes. These are not a list of complaints. They are basic expectations Duluthians have of city government, 
and were recently reflected in a survey done by the Duluth Chamber of Commerce's foundation. I look forward to having a chance to chat about those issues today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to candidate Larson. Thank you so much. Thank you to the league for giving us all this important opportunity. Thank you uh, to viewers who know and understand what is at stake in this race for mayor. My name is Emily Larson. I have served as your mayor. I'm in my eighth year. I live in the Hillside neighborhood with my husband of 24 years, Doug, and we live in the same house, the very same house uh, that we raised our two grown sons in. And I'm running for re-election because the success of this community that we have achieved together is worth accelerating and it's worth fighting for. When I took office, we were doing two miles of road per year. Two miles per year. We are now doing 850% more. When I took office, we started very intentionally building a path for housing. We've created 1,700 new units of housing. That's more than has been created in that same time period in decades. We have decreased crime 22% citywide under my leadership. We have decreased greenhouse gases 32% under my leadership. And we are in our fourth straight record year of private investment and permitting. So all of that success, that's what we're building on. That's what we're building towards. And, and to me, that is, this is the vision that I have always had with this community and with you, which is that every neighborhood should be ones of choice and opportunity and prosperity. And my best hope in this opportunity today is that we're going to talk about our records. We're going to talk about why leadership matters and why who leads the city and how they lead matters. Moving forward, this is our opportunity to accelerate or to risk to truly risk all of this progress, momentum, and growth, and to slip back into old systems and old ways. I am so honored and thrilled to serve, to be here, and to talk today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go on to the questioning round. You'll each have two minutes to answer. Um, candidates, both of you have held office. Candidate Reinert, could you share your greatest accomplish accomplishments in the city of Duluth Council or Minnesota St Senate? Sure. Thanks for that question. You know, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to talk about both of those times of service. Um, you know, the things that I would point to are the things that most people didn't even see happen. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of that we worked on while I was in the city council because it represents the way that I do the work was a way forward for what was then called the Sugarloaf Development. Um, it is a parcel of land that is near Proctor, near our Bayview Heights neighborhood. Um, when it first came forward, it was fought uh, hard by folks who had concerns about losing those forest, forested acres within our city. And I took the opportunity to bring multiple stakeholders to the table and talk about what is it that we would like to see at the end of this. That included developers, it included environmentalists, it included even the Bayview Heights School District and one of the teachers there, Rob Marone, who had been using some of that land to teach students um, and take them into the outdoors. And at the end, what we ended up with, with the help of some smart people who do the work like landscape architecture, is a development that everyone could support moving forward because it include things, included things like deeded restrictions on where you could build on a property, which maintained wildlife corridors through this, pro, uh, through this um, parcel. It actually included gifting some of the land to the school district so the school could continue to use it. I see a time coming. Uh, I'll also point similarly to one of the projects I worked on in the legislature, and that was retaining lights on the Blotnick Bridge. The MnDOT was gonna take those lights off I thought this is an incredible symbol of our Twin Ports community. So worked with Minnesota Power, MnDOT, WizDOT, um, and a new way to do the lights that were both easy to maintain um, and sustainable and being paid for by both states. Thank you. Candidate Larson, your greatest accomplishments as mayor. Thank you so much. Yes, so I was city councilor before mayor. Before that, I was a social worker and a business owner. Um, all of that comes together for me in this work. 
And I'm most proud of our streets plan, that we actually have a sustainable 25-year streets plan. We are on track to do 19 miles next year, more than has been done in literally decades. I'm proud that we have the Cirrus Innovation Center that took an $800,000 annual liability and turned it into a $15 million innovation center. I'm proud of the millions of dollars we have brought in through state bonding and federal funding, including a $25 million raise grant because of the relationships that I have in place with our United States Senators and our Governor. I am proud of the climate action strategy that we have in place, which is leading the nation. The fact that we actually have a lead line remediation program that leads the state, that the state is now following our lead. I am proud that we have been successful, made very challenging decisions along every step of the way. But we've always made the decisions, and I have always led, with integrity and with justice at the heart of what I do, forward moving and knowing and understanding that the decisions we make sometimes, they aren't easy, they aren't meant to be easy. But leading is not just about identifying the challenges. It is about identifying a path and building the relationships through them. I'm proud of the legislation we have passed. I'm eager to talk more about my record and that of my opponent. Thank you. The next question is for Candidate Larson. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your decision-making process. Who do you listen to? How do you decide how and when to act? Great. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is a leadership point, choice point, actually, and I think it's really important we talk about how people make decisions. I choose to, to surround myself and hire and recruit people who are smarter than I am in every single way, and I am unabashed about that. We want the smartest, brightest people leading with us at the city of Duluth. And what I choose to do is to empower them, inform them, give them the tools, the equipment, the staff that they need to move out of their way, to let them take success, to let them stand in the front when things go well. And I will always, always, always be the one to take the heat when it needs to be taken. When we make a big decision on my leadership team, I am the last to speak every time. We go around the room. When we're to the point of making the decision, everyone else weighs in, and I speak last. We have the last conversation we need to have, the last fight we need to have, and when we walk out of this room, we're united in direction. But I also listen and reach out to allies. I have people across the community who I trust, who trust me, who will teach me and tell me the truth when it needs to be said, who will challenge me to be better, and those are conversations that I'm proud of. And those relationships are ones that are supporters now. And I will say this is one leadership distinction between me and my opponent, who in the legislature served eight years, did not pass any signatory bills, did pass eight minor bills in eight years, even during a trifecta, that is about having the relationships to work with people to get things across the finish line. We have gotten more bills passed in bipartisan ways when there wasn't a trifecta because of the strong working relationships, because of doing the research, because every time that I make an ask, whether it is for funding or a budget, I have done the research, we have told the story, and we are ready to deliver. Thank you. Would you like the question repeated? No, I'm fine. Okay, go ahead, All please. Right, thanks. So first, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going back and trying to defend critiques from candidate Larson. I think the community is interested in a conversation about where we're at right now and where we're headed. I love the question. Um, I've had the opportunity to build and lead teams in both my private sector work, my public sector work, and especially within my military service. One really great example that I would point to is the COVID pandemic. Um, at the start of COVID, about mid-March, I got the call from the Navy, uh, would I be willing to head overseas to Italy, which then was a global hotspot. I think we have to go back in time and remember the fear level that we all were facing, the unknown, it wasn't really here yet. Um, would I be willing to step forward and, uh, and head over? And of course, uh, whenever I see a mission and understand it, I'm wired in a way to respond to that. I showed up in uh, Italy after a interesting journey to get there. 
um, and had to put together a team of 13 people that had come from around the world. And in the first 17 days, none of us got to see each other because we were truly in quarantine. And then figure out how to use that team and work together to build a plan that would uh, support 15,000 sailors and their families. Six bases in five countries on three continents. Um, and my leadership style is exactly what was reflected in that experience. It was where are the smart people? How do we set them up for success? How do we collectively set the objective and the outcome where we're headed in an environment that was constantly changing? We were monitoring all those countries. Uh, and folks, I remember we were also monitoring Sweden, who was deciding to do nothing uh, and see how herd immunity went. And then as a leader, it is to find the resources, remove the obstacles, and perhaps most importantly, give them cover uh, so that they can do their work. Thank you. Candidate Reinert, if you are elected, how would you encourage citizen participation at public meetings and amplify the voices of community, communities that have been underserved and underrepresented? Oh, that's a great question, thank you. I think one of the great advantages that we have in our Duluth big small town is relationship. So we're recording this on a Wednesday, just this morning, I had the opportunity to meet with one of the leaders in our community who represents underrepresented voices and just start that process of building relationships. And, and I have many of those relationships in place already, but this one's going to be new to me. And the message that I had for her was, I want to work from a place of relationship. One of the greatest opportunities that you have as mayor is being a facilitator, inviting people to the table um, and encouraging their engagement and investment. You know, the city can't nor should it do everything, but in leveraging the goodwill and the civic heart of our residents, we can get a lot done. And one of the things that people are frustrated with right now is a desire to help be helpful, to engage in youth programming, to engage in our parks and rec services, to have a voice in major city initiatives. And they, they don't always feel like they have that opportunity. And from like a background and a, a, a heart as a civic teacher, what concerns me about that is two things happen over time. One is that there is a growing erosion of trust. And it's not distrust, it's just an erosion of trust. I trust that my voice is valued. I trust that there's an opportunity for me in, to be involved. I trust that I'm able to be engaged. And the other one is disinvestment. And that, we don't use that word in a financial sense, we use it in a social capital sense. We know in Duluth that we have really great bonding social capital. We're, we're good at hanging out um, with people that look and act and sound like us but we, have to, we still have work to do with that bridging. How do we work with others who don't look and act and, and live like us? And the community opportunities for us to get involved and engaged and the invitation from City Hall and the Mayor's Office to do that can really make a, a substantial difference in our community. Thank you. Do you need the question repeated? No, it's, it's just good, thank you. Uh, I love this question too. And I'm gonna speak both to me and to the distinction here and the choice that you have. Here at the City of Duluth, I started Imagine Duluth. It was a comp plan revisit. If you're a comp plan geek like many of us, um, we had a stakeholder group of 40 people, very intentionally broad and diverse, who led that group. It was not the usual suspects on purpose because we're building a broader, bigger community. We spent two years uh, going, we had I think 250 meetings, uh, sessions, surveys, all sorts of input. That has set the direction of what we're doing and where we're going. Out of that came the addition of identity-based commissions here at the City of Duluth, which I have supported and we have worked to staff. The African Heritage Commission, which joined the Indigenous Commission, which already existed, and the GLBTQAI2 Plus Commission, which is now there. I have elevated the role of the Human Rights Officer, which used to be tucked away, not just in a different budget, so it wouldn't show up in the mayor's budget, but also under HR or under the attorney. That is a position that deserved elevation. And I find it interesting that this will be a new emerging priority for my opponent because early on in March, he talked about cutting the mayor's budget. Uh, three of the positions, none of which are new, none of which are new, are the outreach positions, the community relations officer, the public information officer, and the human rights officer. Are they new to that budget area? Absolutely, because I do transparent budgeting where everyone shows up in the category in which they're funded and where they work. 
Uh, pay attention to the deliverables, not just on how we're going to talk about building those relationships or how we're going to start that process of building relationships, but how we're already deeply invested in delivering on those relationships. That is a choice point. Thank you. What do you think of the current relationship between the Duluth de de Police Department and the public? Is it acceptable or should more be done? And if so, what? That's your start. Yes, I'm great. sorry. Great, thank you for the question. This, this is a great question. It's complicated. I will say I, I have hired two police chiefs with this community. I have invested continually in equipment and gear to support our police. And it's also important to listen to the strain and the stress of communities who either feel or are over-policed, especially in an era of post-George Floyd. It's a challenging relationship, and it's okay to acknowledge that. I have full faith and confidence in our police, in the staff, in the quality, and I say that without them even endorsing me in this race, which they never have. And I have always, every term, provided the supports and had their back. From the community perspective, it's important to listen, to listen, and to listen. What I have found out is you have to show up every time early before you are asked, not for a photo op, not to talk about it in a forum, but to just be there and listen. So under my tenure and under my leadership, we have strengthened the Civilian Review Board. We have done a racial bias audit with the police. We have led the way on police uh, body cameras and how we share that information out. We have been incredibly transparent at the request of and partnership with the NAACP on our stop data. And what I tell those audiences is the same thing I'll tell you. You have to tell me what you need. I'm listening, I'm paying attention, and I also have to hear it from you. You will give me the information I need to take back and to ask the core questions. Thank you. Candidate Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't intend to spend our time critiquing records, but if that's if Candidate Larson wants to do that, I'm certainly gonna to respond to it. So the comments about the mayor's budget positions online, we've got it on our YouTube channel. They were live streamed that evening. Um, that is not what I said. I did point out the growth in the mayor's budget, the doubling in positions, the doubling in the budget, and just questioned that in terms of other city priorities. There were no specific suggestions made, just an attempt to help voters who are concerned about property taxes um, understand where some of that growth has been. I am incredibly proud to be supported by the Duluth Police Department and the Duluth Fire Department in this election. They don't feel supported, and I think that's worth noting. Um, they are the ones that we ask to put uniforms on to go out into our community every day to serve and protect, and they do it from the best place, the best civic heart that they can have. Uh, but that is another area where there's been an erosion of trust, and it's especially concerning when these are the folks that have to rush in um, when we have someone killed with gun violence in Lincoln Park and the city is silent, when we have sh homes that are shot up in West Duluth and residents open their door to bullet holes and the city is silent, that is a place where leadership is needed, not just for our um, police department folks, but also for our residents who are wondering what's happening in their neighborhood. There is also another uh, opportunity that I think is important to highlight, and that is where is it that we as residents can be supportive? Because our community is very supportive of Duluth Fire and Duluth Police. Some things that went away during COVID that need to come back. The police reserve, the ability for us to do some things that badge officers don't have to do. A staff person who works just with our citizen patrols within neighborhoods and more classes within the Citizen Academy. And I would just note that, yes, there's been a 22% reduction um, in calls for service. Uh, that is not the reality that most people are experiencing in our community when it comes to crime and public safety. Candidate Reinert, a number of housing units are, are being built or are newly completed. Most of them are apartments or condos and relatively few are single family Correct. residences. Do you feel that this is a good strategy to meet the housing shortage, which you have both identified as a critical need? If not, what do you propose, or how do you propose to address that issue going forward? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, thank you for that question. 
So I know we'll hear the figure of 1,700 new units. Um, one of the challenges that we have, and it's the reason that I will talk about housing across all the income levels, is they have to be more than affordable units, and they have to be ones that put um, property taxes back into the system. Where the Duluth housing market is most stuck right now is in the middle. And as you note in the question, it's actually in for sale homes. It's becoming a significant challenge in a couple different areas. Number one, we can note that in the last decade, we only grew by 400 people. And a limiting factor in that is a lack of housing affordability. Our neighbors grew. Every regional center in Minnesota grew by an average of 10%, and we grew by 400.01%. Housing for purchase is a major um, factor in that. Two, it's a huge issue for our employers as they attempt to attract and retain employees. Employers who can't uh, find housing for their employees in the community can't retain. And we see it. We see it in major employers who have attracted people to our community. They rent, they can't buy, they give up, and they move somewhere else. Eventually, those employers are going to wonder that same thing. Should, would we be better off in a different community where we can attract and retain talent? The city should not be in the business of building housing. Where we need to be uh, heavily involved is in infrastructure. We got $58 million in ARPA funds. Um, the proposal now that includes the reallocation of the remaining 24, like that is dollars that could be used to actually move the needle on streets, water, sewer, gas infrastructure that right now is carried on the back of developers, sometimes to the tune of $100,000 before they even start building a home. And it's a significant factor in not being able to get homes to the market at an affordable price point. But 10 or 15 or 20 new homes in the last uh, handful of years is not enough to actually move that mid-market where we're stuck. Do you want me to repeat? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. A number of housing units are being built or are newly completed. Most are apartments or condos and relatively few are single family residences. Do you feel that this is a good strategy to meet the housing shortage, which you both have identified as a critical need? If not, what do you propose to address that issue going forward? Thank you. I convened a mayor's task force for housing. Out of that task force, which was co-convened by the uh, Northland Foundation and Northspan, we established several innovative programs. One of them also includes a $16 million housing trust fund that goes directly into buying down gap financing, affordability, infrastructure costs. It is really important to ask the core question of how we will do some of these things. That housing trust fund is funded through $4 million we made from the city. We leveraged $12 million from banks and local initiative support corporation. That money is going directly into accelerating housing. That is innovative and it is tied legislatively language wise so that when and if the Minnesota legislature decides to invest in housing trust funds, we are prepared for that. Just yesterday, I announced with a, a room full of downtown folks, the downtown housing study that projects that we have the capacity for 2,000 units of housing downtown by flipping office into housing. We will be making our first announcement tomorrow. That is innovative. And having that project and that study at the forefront is what cities just now are starting to think about. We did an economic development audit that is refining how we do permitting, how quickly are we are able to move forward, and how we can streamline to get those things done faster. And I question the notion that we have ARP funds. This tells me that my opponent is not familiar fully both with the opportunities of funding that we have and how they are used. A third of that funding was already used to invest in housing. There is nothing left to be reallocated because it went to support this community during the pandemic, which is, I think, important. We choose to use the tools of tax abatement and tax increment financing to help with the infrastructure. That's co-investment with St. Louis County, which is a good, uh, a good way to use our resources and our money. That is something my opponent said he's unwilling to do. And, uh, and I will continue to use those tools to meet those needs. Candidate Larson, mm -hmm. what is the most important infrastructure project needed in Duluth right now, and how would you move it forward? 
Lead lines. Lead lines is by far one of the most important infrastructure projects and my opponent is silent on that. And I will continue to help us see the distinction and choice in uh, the vote that you have moving forward. Uh, we have a plan that we self-funded that we started because of our amazing infrastructure staff here in the city. We did a pilot project that funded $250 million from the state. It will go up to a billion dollars from the state to get all lead lines out. We have kids in neighborhoods that, that have lead in their water. My house is one of them in the hillside. We have three projects scheduled for next year. In addition to the project we just did in a different hillside neighborhood, not mine, uh, we have a project slated for Lincoln Park, for Hillside, and for Gary New Duluth next year. It is not optional people have to have clean drinking water. We're also tying that in to the other infrastructure work that we're doing. We're doing 19 miles of street next year. This year was the very first year we patched all primary and secondary roads across the city. It is the first year that we had a full complement of seasonal workers. The last time my opponent was in a position of local decision making, over the subsequent of his five years, he cut street maintenance and heavy operation workers from 32 to 23. We have been scraping for every position since we're back up to 29, but this is where the details of the how, of the why, how it's paid for, and previous work and record matters. Candidate Reiner. Thank you. Um, and I do think the why question matters. Why now? Like, why now are we looking at 19 miles next year? Why now are we using reserve funds on streets? Why now is this a priority? I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that we've been highlighting streets from the very beginning of our campaign. And that is the single infrastructure issue that Duluthians are most concerned about. I challenge anyone in this community to go from one end of Duluth to the other uh, and not talk about streets. Um, and I think what makes me laugh a little is people in the west part of the community think that the east streets are perfect and people out east think that Duluth streets are, are that they have the terrible streets and I have the pleasure of saying no, like they're, they're bad streets in every neighborhood in our community. And being able to patch from one end of Duluth to the other is nice, but that's a band-aid. We have to be very serious about how we move a streets project forward. And even at 19, which we would be a record mile, that means almost 420 other miles are getting worse at the same time. The single greatest thing that we can do in this area, and there's a litany of things, they're on my website, rogerfordeluth.org, the single greatest thing we can do is take a lesson learned from one of our partners, St. Louis County. I had the opportunity to sit for a couple hours with the county engineering department and ask the really simple question, why do you do 3,000 miles so well and we do 460 poorly? And they had a number of suggestions, but the biggest one was when they got their half cent sales tax, something, a tool that I authored while I was in the legislature, I think significant in getting that passed. They said, we went out and bonded against that and in three years spent $68 million fixing roads. And now we primarily crack, uh, seal the cracks and do street maintenance instead of repairing. If you don't get there, city of Duluth, you will never get over the hill of diminishing returns on your street infrastructure. Thank you. Candidate Reiner, how do you feel about the transportation options currently available in Duluth? What plans, if any, do you have to increase options for reliable public transportation? No. I think transportation falls in a couple different categories. One, what are our transportation connections to the rest of the region and the state? I've always been a transportation proponent. For most of the time I served in the legislature, had the pleasure of serving on the transportation committee. It is a get your hands dirty, um, concrete bad pun um, area of government. And the fact that our community has rail, has road, has an airport, has a port, um, soon to have passenger rail, I think is advantageous to our community. And I know there are critics of passenger rail out there. I was supportive as a counselor. I was on the Joint Powers Authority as a counselor, was an advocate as a legislature. I think this is a good thing for our community. Within our community, we have to continue to look at transportation options. We have a good bus system. I'm proud of the work that the DTA is doing. They're really challenging themselves to look differently and think differently. 
that one of our gatherings last week on Thursday, I had two women who only use the bus system talk about the challenges that they're having during that transition, not being able to find stops, stops moving, buses not being on time, missing appointments, not showing up late for work. Um, and one of them I said, uh, who also had served in a similar role in another community, I said, I hope that you will apply to, the, for, to be on the DTA board. Um, that is an opportunity for people to actively use the system to have that feedback. And I'll also just highlight something that may seem a little bit trite within the heavy conversations we're having, but the um, lack of things like Uber and Lyft within our community are something that many residents point to. And I don't know exactly what the role is, how we can highlight that, how we can uh, get more of that service, but it is something that folks more and more rely on, especially post-pandemic. It's something our college student population relies on to move around the community. And the adequate, reliable service of things like Uber and Lyft means that other people in our community maybe don't have to have a vehicle paired with our um, bus system. Thank you. Candidate Larson. Thank you. Uh, there's two ways I want to answer the question. First of all, let's talk again about how we fund streets. That is the most common transportation network that we have. I am surprised to hear the, this degree of priority on how my opponent wants to fund streets, and here's why. In 2008, the city of Duluth, when he was a city councilor, did one mile of street. That was not because of Palenti's on allotment. That was before that happened. So I appreciate and applaud that this is a new uh, and inspired commitment, but using bonding is why we got in that mess. And it is risky, it is so risky to our financial future, to our bond rating, to the things that help us leverage investment and be a good bet for federal grants, federal investment, and state investment. It's your bond rating. We were so over bonded when I took office, we had $600,000 a year to work with. Everything else was going to pay old debt. We have spent the last seven years paying as we go, investing as we go, not carrying debt, and being free to move forward and fully invest, doing more mileage than has ever been done. So pay attention to those details. When it comes to transportation, I have been a big fan of, of DTA and public transportation in my entire life. Um, I didn't have a car myself until I was probably 27 or 28. I only got around by walking and taking the bus. So making sure that we have good bus lines and rapid transit through busing is really important. Also ensuring that we have connective safe ways that people can walk uh, or bike. Uh, and I'll just say now, the city of Duluth, people like to call me a bike mayor. We have one half mile of dedicated bike lane one half mile of dedicated bike lane. Every other paved surface is for you to walk and bike and use a stroller or roller bike, whatever you wanna do. They're public and they're open. They are not just bike lanes. And it's important to talk about that because that's where people gather, that's where they build social connection, that's where they feel safe, and that's how they get around. Candidate Larson, mm -hmm. is the city doing enough to address the issue of people experience home, experiencing homelessness what, if anything, could, would you do differently? Thank you. I, I know that we're doing all that we can right now with all the resources that we have. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, we have, and many of you know, I was a social worker with CHUM for 12 years, so this issue is one that I have a very strong record on. Um, we invested one-third of our ARP funds into affordable housing. Conversely, my opponent, when he was in city council, voted three times against affordable projects. Uh, we are working with the Stepping On Up model, which Chum and others in the community are leading, which is a multi-phase idea about how we take care of immediate housing, short-term, and then long-term. Long-term, what we need is about two more San Marco housing developments that work with people and meet them where, they at, where they're at. I think we need one for mental health and we need one for drug addiction. But right now, we have 18 staff across departments, public safety, planning, parks, uh, communications. They meet three times a week <laughs> with the county, with the state, with CHUM, because it's going to take all of us, it's going to take all of our resources on how we do this differently and how we do it better. What we need in the long term is just more units. 
as a board member of the Greater Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, as a board member of the National League of Cities that prioritizes housing, I have those relationships to bring big investments to help make that possible. Um, and that really, really matters on this. But we do also need to increase and help the community find ways that they can invest, whether that is donating to organizations that need your support, whether that is ensuring that we are all um, paying into the warming center and expanding hours. Maybe it's volunteering at Loaves and Fishes. What, one of the things that I like to always say is that while none of us, none of us are comfortable with seeing homelessness, it's a terrible feeling. Um, and it's unsettling. And these are also someone's mother or father or son or daughter. And we also need to have that at the core as we're working hard to help solve the problem and the pre-problems that are creating that circumstance to begin with. Can it, Ryder? Great, thank you. And I think in uh, that response is what is inherently dangerous about picking uh, at a record. I also voted 11 times for affordable housing projects including the 10-year plan uh, to end ho homelessness that uh, then Commissioner Steve O'Neill was working on. And when on the council, uh, supported, and it was the most controversial issue when I was running in my 05 election, the San Marco project. Um, then strongly opposed by Duluth police, um, who again now are supporting me in, the, in this election. And they will say that it was amazing for folks in our community struggling with chronic alcoholism, not just in terms of um, helping with being on the street, going through detox and kind of ending that endless cycle, but having a clean, safe, supportive living place, also with services. So folks who have the ability to reach for recovery are able to do that, but if they're not, able to win over their disease, they have a safe, humane place to be. We absolutely need something like that for folks in our community struggling with mental health um, amplified by the opioid crisis. And longer term, one of the things that we need to be doing at the state is advocating again for the regional treatment system. We dismantled that in the late 80s into the early 90s. We used to have regional treatment centers with long-term care beds. Because right now what is really under, underlying um, the homelessness issue and tent encampment issue throughout our community is no place else for folks to be. So I live right off Masaba Avenue, um, where again we're recording on Wednesday the 20th. MnDOT recently cleaned out a, about a half a dozen encampments that were right along there. Folks didn't just disappear, they just found other places to be, including just a couple blocks up the hill where we have a little wooded parcel. We as a community have to say, like that's not healthy for the individual, it's not healthy for our community. So in the short term, working with existing nonprofits, midterm, looking at a project like San Marcos, supportive living, long term, advocating with the legislature to reestablish the regional treatment system. Thank you. Kenneth Reinhardt, um, what is your position on privatizing currently funded services within the Duluth governmental budget? Example, Comfort systems, parks, libraries, jails. Yep. Um, and I'm not going to use two minutes to uh, answer that. That's not something that I've been supportive of. I think the only time we even explored that, uh, when then Herb Bergson was uh, mayor, um, he was interested in trying to lease uh, the utility uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, there, when we choose to live in community, and it's always the response I have with folks who want to challenge uh, taxation as a concept, when we choose to live in community, taxes are how we collectively buy things we could never afford on our own. We can't individually pay for sewer system, water system, uh, heating system, road system, schools, public safety, and fire. We collectively do those things, and we do them via taxes, and we do them as public services and public systems so that those who use the systems have an opportunity to have feedback. Natural gas is a really great example. I think because it is a publicly owned entity, they are always, Comfort Systems is always very attuned to the price that we're paying for natural gas. Even as we saw it skyrocketing around the country, it was a service that was still largely affordable for most Duluthians, and of course we rely on natural gas for many of us to, to heat our homes in the winter. We definitely have a challenge with an aging infrastructure system. It's why I am disappointed that with $58 million of ARPA funding, we didn't do more in investing in our core utility infrastructure. I think with the trifecta that's been referenced, there is an opportunity there for our regional centers and our aging cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul 
to talk to the governor and the legislature about a one-time general generational investment in infrastructure, something that President Biden did very well, got through Congress, one of the few bipartisan things that did get passed, because we as a country are there, we as a city are there, and these are publicly held assets that we share in common with each other. Thank you. Candy Larson, do you want to repeat it? No, oh, I good. think I'm good. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. I oppose any private privatizing of city services. I do. I'm very consistent in that. When I was on city council, there was a proposal to sell. I think it was the steam plant at the time. I opposed it. I want universal services that you have to have, that there are a monopoly on. <laughs> Those should always be publicly held. I actually think other, there are other utilities that, that, uh, and services that I think could be publicly held, but the ones that the city of Duluth currently owns are the ones you will always own under my watch. Um, I actually also believe that broadband, which is an emerging absolute daily need and infrastructure need, is something that, that can and should be publicly owned. It isn't right now. Those are privately owned monopolies that the public has no oversight of, no cost control impact of, and no public controls over. We can't even control where they put the, um, you know, the poles to put the connectivity in. So no, I will not privatize um, under any circumstance. And this lead line project that we are leading, that is funded through ARP funds. That's how we got it started. And I'm grateful to the federal government for the vision to help communities lead their own and trust mayors to lead their communities through the pandemic. That's exactly how we got on the forefront of that issue. Uh, additionally, I'm proud of our Public Utilities Commission. They are, they are a separate decision-making body. They have been very clear in developing a plan that is integrating all of the streets work that we do. We're no longer coming out to fix a pipe one year and then coming back to fix your street the next. That's intentional. <laughs> That's because we have actually changed how we're doing the work. We've hired a transportation planner to help us convene with the county and the state on their project. All of that is the value all of that is the value of public work and having to think always not just about how am I going to meet the needs of this community, but how am, how am I going to meet them well within the resources that we have? We don't have to pay back to shareholders, but we do have to pay back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Candidate Larson. Yeah. What do you see as the main environmental issues facing Duluth? And what is your plan to address those issues? Well, it all comes back to climate change for me. And this is an issue that my opponent's been absolutely silent on. So I'll be eager to hear, uh, hear the response. Uh, climate change is causing significant financial damage, emotional damage, home property damage, um, as evidenced, <clears throat> whether it's the 2012 flood or more recently under my tenure, the storms, the hurricane level storms down the Lake Walk, which completely flooded Canal Park, made it so you couldn't get to Park Point and absolutely um, deteriorated public infrastructure, the public infrastructure that holds up seawalls and makes the city work. Under my leadership, we have fixed that. The, we have not had a storm failure since. That's because we have prioritized climate resilience and how we rebuilt the lake walk. We brought in $70 million to rebuild that lake walk. And we didn't just fix it and patch it. We went into the ground. We re-engineered the seawalls. We made it so that not only is it beautiful, and you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't need to know all of the work that went into that. But in doing so, we protected all of the infrastructure and street and roads and hotels and um, sewer that leads into that. We made sure that Park Point residents can get across. Um, that is the kind of integrated thinking that climate change is causing us to do and causing us to bring. We now have a, under my leadership, we have a climate action plan with this community. We have an energy plan commission. We have a sustainability officer that last year, last year this one position brought in $33 million into this community. My vision, because this race isn't just about what you've done, it's about moving forward. My vision is to accelerate our decrease to greenhouse gases, 32% already, go net zero uh, by 2050, which is my public commitment, that race to zero, and to go solar on our water pumps, which is our highest and biggest expense uh, that we have to pass on to all of you to go solar there. Thank you. Candidate Reiner. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the things that we just have to be mindful of, of course, is that as one individual community, we're not going to be able to change the climate. 
it is something that we as individuals um, can be attentive to and advocate for. The work of city government is how do we respond to the impacts that we're seeing from climate change. Ken A. Larson and I were both at a Park Point Community Club forum just last evening, so this is our second in about 12 hours, and that was a huge issue for them. And the interconnectedness of these responses always matter. So the work done on the lake walk is actually exasperating erosion of Park Point. The hardening of one part of it is creating more erosion in a softer part of it. Those things are always interconnected. And our work of, at city government is thinking about those investments and impacts and how we look down the chain. An important neighborhood for our community that is under stress from climate change. And I look back and I, I look at the work we did in 2012 in response to that catastrophic um, weather event that we experienced in Duluth. I remember it well. I was serving in the legislature, and I know my legislative record's been critiqued, but that was a bill I authored that brought millions of dollars from the state and also the federal government in response to critical infrastructure impact to our community. And in that, res in that repair, we always looked ahead at what could we see coming and how can we beef up um, the infrastructure that we have in response. So when we had a six inch rainfall event just uh, um, under two weeks ago, we didn't see the same sorts of impacts that we saw in 2012. And before my time is up, I just also wanna highlight an issue that not, not a lot of folks are tracking, and that's the PFAS that is right now flowing through the way, uh, um, Western Lake Superior Sanitary District out into Lake Superior. Like, that is not a city function per se, but it is happening in our community. And even though that's the best practice of diluting it, we're still letting it out into the lake. And I think that's something that we need to be concerned about. Thank you. Candidate Reiner, um, there is a proposal before the city council to eliminate the parking space requirement for some new construction. Mm -hmm. Do you support this proposal? What can we do to ensure that this would not have a negative effect on neighborhoods where parking is already an issue. Yeah, and I think that is in the question is also the answer. You know, we have to be thoughtful about changes we make that apply writ large across the um, community. Um, and I know that announcement is coming up, so it will be interesting, or not the announcement, the invitation for community feedback. It will be interesting to see the feedback that the community does give. In some places, absolutely in our downtown, in our business areas, to eliminate the parking um, minimums is a smart move. We wanna have increased density. We wanna have the opportunity for people to live without having to have vehicles. You know, and if we, for folks in our community who are suspect of this, if you just wanna look at the cost of maintaining the street infrastructure, the less vehicles we have using the very same infrastructure means that that infrastructure lasts longer. You know, we're all driving around, many of us are driving around plus or minus 4,000 pound vehicles moving back and forth on those streets. So it's a, it's a math problem. And it's also a style choice that, um, that people are choosing. I always say it's me and a dog in a hillside home, and I would be downtown if there was an opportunity to own and an opportunity to walk and an opportunity to not have a vehicle. So in those commercial uh, areas where that already feels like that fits the form of the district, very appropriate. But the flip side of that is neighborhoods that feel um, vehicle pressure, that feel the weight of not having enough off-street parking. A couple Saturdays ago, I sat with residents from the Kenwood area near UMD who are very concerned about these issues. And as a counselor, it's another example of work I did that maybe didn't get attention or maybe isn't gonna be lifted up, but we looked at what does a college student housing district look like? What are the parking minimums? How many um, residents can you have in, on a particular street? How many rentals should you have within a particular neighborhood? Because we're ending up in a couple places with neighborhoods that don't have neighbors. Thank you. Do you want to repeat it? Or are you good? No, I'm good. Go Thank ahead. you so much. Um, this is a great question. Yes, I actually I do support this policy. We will see what the input is and, and what people bring to that. Um, but expanding our tax base and seeing progress in housing and growth, it requires us to use every single tool that we have. Whether that's around loosening up a parking, whether that is around permitting, whether that is around infill development, 
Um, this is whether that's around how we use a resource like Leicester Golf, which, which could be activated for economic expansion, housing, and expanding our tax base, improving working conditions, and providing new working conditions for people. All of that's so important. We have to be open to these new ideas. Uh, so yes, uh, some of how we have gone through making that recommendation too is, I think, important to pay attention to. This didn't just come out of somebody thinking we should do that. It's in listening. It's in reflecting what people are letting us know is holding back their choice to invest. It's in listening to what developers are telling us would actually be one of the keys that unlocks a major development, whether it's 500 new units of housing that are coming in downtown or something up on top of the hill or organizing parking differently in neighborhoods along with neighbors. Yes, this is just one tool. It's an important tool. And I have found as mayor, people love to talk about parking. <laughs> we talk a lot about parking parking because how you get around where you park how it feels all of that really matters people pay attention to that and if they can figure out where they park then they can figure out how they're going to shop how they're going to live how they're going to get around how they're going to feel comfortable and safe so very important issue yes I do support this um, it isn't a decision that I make it is one that will come through all the proper channels Planning Commission City Council very public because the public transparency of decision making is something that we really believe in something that I believe in as mayor and have always held to. So we will follow the will of those elected and appointed bodies. Thank you. This is the last question before your closing statements. Um, Candidate Larson, mm -hmm. what is an important challenge facing our city that has not been addressed in these questions and how would you address that challenge? Well, we have a lot of challenges, right? I mean, let's be, let's be really honest. So part of leading isn't just about identifying the challenges. We, we need to do that. We do do that. We can talk about the need to expand our tax base. This is the first year of the budget I am providing and have provided and supported going to the city council actually decreases your, lo your local property tax for the first time in years. Your property tax for local taxes will go down. We need to help people alleviate that burden of what they're experiencing. And as we talk about whether it's the challenge of how we pay for things or how we want to co-invest in taxes, one of the things that we really have to identify, especially in this race, is what is the how? How will we get there? What is the plan? What is the vision? Because identifying challenges does not lead us to a vision. Identifying grievances does not give us a path through them. Pay attention to what the details are and what different may bring. Different may be exactly what you want, but different isn't necessarily going to deliver a different outcome. My commitment has always been to be realistic about challenges, to listen to what people are telling us, to listen to what they're not saying, to focus specifically on how we can staff a policy, how, can, how we can advocate for the needs that are important to you. And the challenges that we have right now include all the ones that we've talked about. But it also includes ensuring that we have equitable access to universal services like parks and libraries. We didn't talk about that today, but later on today I'll be re-announcing something we shared last week two weeks ago maybe, which is a 10-year four-phase plan to invest in city parks across the city and youth sports um, venues, right? So ensuring that we have equitable access to sense of place activities like parks and libraries, this is something that we had, did not get a chance to talk about today and libraries in particular is something that is incredibly important as we move forward. We need that sense of place and we need that connectivity. Thank you. Do you want me to repeat? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think the question was, what issue have we not touched on? Um, and I would highlight growing our commercial tax base. You know, it's one of the five big issues that we've spent the campaign talking about. And it really comes from two places. One is Duluth, whether it's earned or not, has a reputation as a difficult place to do business. Um, and I had an opportunity this morning to sit with a room full of folks who are interested in investing in Duluth, who have had struggles in investing in Duluth, um, professionals who support those who are investing in Duluth, and they agreed with that uh, assessment of it's a difficult place to do business, especially when contrasted with neighbors like Hermantown and Superior, where their folks just have a very different experience. And those of us who live in the Twin Ports have seen that as we move from community to community. 
And the reason that that matters is because of where city government primarily gets its revenue. And that can't be local government aid as almost a third of our revenue budget. That is just unreliable. We might be doing well with it now, but we have had other years where we have not done well with it, depending on how the political winds are blowing in St. Paul. The way that we mitigate that is addressing our own earned revenue. And primarily that's commercial property tax. That pays most of the bill in Minnesota. And when we don't do a good job growing our commercial property tax, residential homeowners and residential payers feel that. So we've seen that doubling in the last eight years, more than doubling for many because of significant valuation increases on our homes. Last year we had a 9% proposed property tax. 2% this year is great. But unless your home does not increase in value, which has not happened to anyone in several years, you are going to pay more. And it's something that people are very concerned about in this election. So growing our commercial property tax in order to take pressure off of our residential and to make us more self-sustaining is by far the biggest issue we've not talked about today. At this time, we will ask each candidate to give a two-minute closing statement. We will start with candidate Larson. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and PAC TV. Thank you to the many city workers who keep this city, city working and safe for all. I'm running for mayor because many of the successes we were able to talk about today are our successes. All of the successes are ours. Streets, climate, decreasing crime, increasing housing, increasing for the fourth year in a row, private record, private investment. This is your choice to continue to accelerate thoughtfully engaged with you in progress that can ensure that all neighbors in all neighborhoods feel seen, safe, heard, that they prosper, that they have opportunity. That is a vision. That is the vision we have built and we have created together. I'm deeply proud of the work that we do here as a city. I'm deeply proud of the work that I do as a mayor. And I'm deeply proud of every single thing in my record. We didn't pick everything apart today, but I want to come back to one item. Expanding our tax base is best done by utilizing every single tool and every single property that we have, including Lester Golf, to do so. And when we're talking about property taxes, I do want to point out that my opponent raised property taxes in his five years as city councilor and voted in support of each of these 52%. 52% in five years. So pay attention to consistency. This is a really important vote for you. It's an important vote for this community. We'll get another job. We'll be fine. But pay attention to the direction, to the consistency, to the record, to the stability, to the tenacity, to the performance, to the deliverables. My name is Emily Larson. I live in the hillside. I serve as your mayor. And I'm asking for your support in this fall's election to continue this progress this growth, and this momentum. Thank you. Kenneth Reiner. Great, thank you. Uh, just again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Every time we have one of these, I learn something new. Um, I'm running for mayor because like many in our community, I'm just ready for something different. Like you, I'm concerned about the five big issues. Many of them we talked about today, housing across all income levels, growing our commercial tax base, streets, I always say that all caps with exclamation marks, downtown Duluth and affordable property taxes. Like you, I believe there are practical, tangible steps the next mayor and administration can take in each of these areas, and it's time we do. And earning 63% of your vote in the primary told me we're on the right track, that these are not just my issues or a list of complaints, they are also your big issues. Duluth, right now we are sort of good and we should be exceptional. Our unique neighborhoods, our abundant outdoor spaces, the big lake, and of course, our people. In the last census, as I mentioned earlier, we grew by 400 residents, 0.01%, while other regional centers in Minnesota averaged 10%. Friends, that's not growth, that's stagnation. City government cannot do everything, nor should it. Our role is to be a good partner, to do the hard work of paying attention to the basics, streets, utilities, and public safety, our neighborhood parks and community centers, effective, efficient, and at a tax rate we can both afford and sustain. When done right, it doesn't even make the news, it just works. And it's a foundation that allows our residents to succeed, our neighbors, uh, neighborhoods to grow, and our businesses to thrive. You've had the opportunity to see my public service for nearly 20 years. I have a deep commitment to our community, our state, and our country. 
You've also had the opportunity to see how I do the work, thoughtful, approachable, and hands-on. The ability to gather diverse stakeholders and develop practical solutions. And I'll just close by inviting you to check us out online. We're at rogerfordeluth.com. Our socials are at Roger for Duluth. Duluth, if asked to be your mayor, it will be the service of a lifetime. Thank you. This concludes this candidate forum for Office of Mayor of the City of Duluth. It is our purpose in sponsoring meetings such as this to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss the issues that are important to you. There is never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time setting such as this. If your questions were not addressed, you should feel free to contact the candidates directly. Also check out our Vote 411 online for candidate information. We hope this program has helped you learn about more, more about the candidates and the issues so that you can make an informed choice at the polls on Tuesday, November 7th. Thank, we thank the candidates and PAC-TV for making this event possible. The forum is also partially funded by a grant from the League of Women Voters Education Fund 2023 people who are currently, who are former, sorry, sorry, formerly or currently incarcerated voter registration project. PAC-TV will carry this forum and others. Check their listings for a schedule of times. Links to these forums will also be on the League of Women Voters of Duluth website. Thank you to everyone.